Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here today. And I always like to start, or somewhere in my talks, give you a little feel for the person. I'm going to give you lots of technical talks today, technical statistical uh, findings, theoretical findings. But here's a poem that was written by one of our kids after he had graduated from our group intervention program. And I think it's just nice to remember that there's always a human being underneath all of the symptoms and treatments that we talk about. So evidence-based practices for bipolar spectrum disorders in youth. Little conflict of interest on funding sources. Okay, the first half of this talk, I'm going to talk about the rationale for biopsychosocial treatment, and I'm going to give you a bit of a whirlwind tour of a lot of different concepts. And I want you, as I'm talking, to start just gathering little golden nuggets in your head of, oh, well, that would be important for treatment. That would be important for treatment. Oh, yeah, I don't want to be thinking about that. Just start making a little collection in your mind of all the things that matter when it comes to children and mood symptomatology. Second half of the talk, I'll give you the summary of the evidence-based treatment to date, and I'll end a little bit quickly just giving you some resources. I, I hate to end a talk without providing resources for therapists and families. So what do we know about environmental contributions to manic symptoms in youth? Not a whole lot. So I'm going to draw on literature from some related areas. Adults with bipolar disorder, adolescents with major depressive disorder, at-risk populations, and the little bit that we know about youth with bipolar disorder. And as I'm talking about this, I'm not talking, if you think about there's cause or etiology and course. And course is when do you have onset and then how does the course of illness um, evolve over time? So we're going to, when we think about psychosocial impact, can you hear me back there? Okay. So when we talk about psychosocial impact, we're really thinking more about that onset and course rather than the actual cause or etiology. So other under environmental effects for adults with bipolar disorder, let me just start with a quick little overview and then we're going to hit a variety of domains, physical and sexual abuse, lack of diagnosis and treatment, family climate, stressful life events and social support. So precipitants of episodes in adults with bipolar disorder, what really sets an adult off? We know that onset of early episodes are more likely related to stressful life events than onset of later episodes. This is consistent with what Robert Post has called the kindling hypothesis, meaning at the beginning, you really need some kindling to get things started. But as your illness really progresses, it takes less and less and less in your environment to push you into another episode. There's significantly more uh, significant stressful life events before manic episodes. Work-related stressful life events in particular may be important in mania and hypomania. Cyclothymic disorder is associated with an increased stress response consistent with it being on the bipolar spectrum. And it's bidirectional. The mood symptoms can cause stressful life events and the stressful life events can trigger an episode. Stressful life events often lead to sleep loss, which most certainly can precipitate mania as well as alcohol and drug use, which can also lead to sleep loss and or mania. So what's the role of psychosocial stress in the onset and progression? Preclinical studies in multiple animal species clearly document the lifelong impact of early life stress. And this is particularly in that, those pertinent developmental windows. We see this in the neurochemistry, the endocrine responsivity, and behavior. In humans, early severe environmental adversity is linked to earlier age of onset, more serious and complicated and treatment resistant course. So we'll see people with more, who will be more likely to present with rapid cycling, suicide attempts, longer illness duration, more substance abuse, alcohol abuse, PTSD, more comorbid lifetime access one disorders, and greater overall mood symptom severity. In general, it's a bigger mess. Okay. Childhood trauma, as you might expect, is more impairing than trauma that comes later in life. The earlier it comes, the worse it is. And this leads to increased negative life events in adulthood. Okay, so there's a little bit of an overview. Let's talk specifically about physical and sexual abuse. Some of the best work has been done by Leverich and Post. Uh, they studied 651 outpatients with bipolar type 1, meaning the full mania, the full depression, or bipolar type 2, meaning hypomania and full depression. Uh, a little over half were females. Half of them had been abused. Uh, many of them had both physical and sexual abuse. Uh, about a third of the males had been abused. Again, most of them had both physical and sexual abuse. Abuse was associated with, as you heard in that earlier review, earlier onset, more access one, two, and three diagnoses, faster cycling, higher rates of suicide attempts, more psychosocial stressors occurring before the first and the most recent episode. 
Okay. Not good to be abused. This isn't a news flash, but it really also relates to mood disorders and bipolar disorder in particular. How about lack of diagnosis and treatment? We know also from uh, that same investigative group that the earlier the age of onset is linked to the longest delay in treatment. So what that really means is if your onset started quite early, say under 12, if I can get through the plants here, uh, compared to the adolescent 13 to 18 year old, 19 to 29 or 30, if you all end up getting treatment at about the same time, clearly if you had the earliest age of onset, there's been the biggest gap where you've been ill without intervention. And so those have been very struggling years for per people. How about family climate? And again, this is a whirlwind tour I'm giving you. So some of the nicest work in this has been done by Dr. David Miklowitz, and this was his work uh, done at UCLA. They looked at family expressed emotion. Expressed emotion is an interesting term. Uh, the first time I ever gave a talk at a national conference on expressed emotion, somebody from the audience said, only, somebody, only a British person would use the term expressed emotion with a negative connotation. So I didn't make that up. But what does expressed emotion mean? When you hear that term, you think, oh, it's like expressing your emotions. Isn't that what happens in therapy? Isn't that good? That's not what this term means. Expressed emotion in this context means kind of a high, intrusive, critical, in your, what I would call the in-your-face parent, always there with something negative to say. So it's expressed emotion of a negative, intrusive kind of a quality. So if you come from a low EE family, nine months later, you had practically a 50-50 chance of having a relapse. If you came from a high EE family, look at the difference between relapse uh, and no relapse. So much more likely when you go back as an adult into a home that's characterized by that kind of negative, intrusive, always there with something bad to say, much more likely to have a recurrence. Okay. Family climate obviously matters. How about stressful life events and social support? Um, Connie Hammond and colleagues at UCLA prospectively followed 52 adults with bipolar type 1 every three months for up to 12 months. And they created a variable they called the base, baseline total network support sc score. And that was perceived self-support from your best friend, your parent, and your romantic partner. And what they found is that depressive recurrence predict was predicted independently by high degrees of stress and low degrees of social support levels after controlling for duration of illness and medication compliance. Social support did not moderate the impact of stress, and there was no differential effect based on where your support came from. So it's important to have support. Stressful life events and bipolar disorder in, in adults. Sherry Johnson, who used to be in Miami, now is out in California, uh, looked at family criticism and stressful life events and found that they predicted uh, an increase in symptoms and relapse over time. Stressful life events, uh, this is a review paper that they had prepared. Uh, uh, Ellicott and colleagues found a fourfold increase in relapse risk, and Johnson and Miller reported a threefold increase in time to recovery. So again, think about that course of illness variable bad to have a lot of stress in your life. It also predicted specific symptoms. Depressive symptoms were predicted by stressful life events, expressed emotion, and social support. There were similar predictors whether you had unipolar or bipolar depression. Manic symptoms were predicted by schedule disrupting and goal attainment life events. So something that throws your sleep cycle off, something that's a positive, a graduation, a promotion, uh, something, uh, a, a degree, those are good things, but they can also push somebody into a manic or hypomanic episode. Okay. So, kind of keep some of those little nuggets in mind. Now we're going to shift to adolescents with major depression. What do we know about them? Life stress robustly predicts psychiatric symptoms, particularly depression. And if you are a depressed teenager, chances are good mom or dad has depression or has had depression. We know that maternal depression is linked to increased stress reactivity and increased stress exposure. Dependent life events, dependent meaning it's dependent on kind of the person as opposed to independent. If I'm a teenager and I'm depressed and my dad gets a job transfer and we move out of state, that's an independent life stressor. But if I'm depressed and I'm really crabby and irritable and I break up with my boyfriend, that's a dependent life event. You follow that. So dependent life events may be particularly and understandably linked to mood disorders. Okay. How about at-risk populations? What do we know there? Five different areas. We'll talk about parenting, biological impact, family climate, stressful life events, and social support. This was a really fascinating, in-depth kind of study that's hard to do today, back in 1984 when it was a little easier to get funding. So this was in the intramural branch of NIMH. They had seven couples. One partner had bipolar disorder, and they compared them to normal control couples. They had apartments where you could come and live at NIMH for a long period of time and have all kinds of incredible in-depth observation. 
just makes a researcher's heart go pitter-pat. So the mothers from the bipolar disorder couples were less attentive to their children's health needs, and these were, you know, little tiny children, less active with their child, more overprotective, disorganized, unhappy, tense, and ineffective, and they emphasized performance in some achievement-related areas, displayed more negative affect toward the child. These are not good things. The index parent had lower scores for social adjustment and family interaction and more situational problems. There were seven male infants of the parents with BPD, and of those seven families, five, the other parent had unipolar depression. So genetically, as well as family environment, these little infants were hit with a whammy. They demonstrated insecure attachments, problems with affect regulation and coping with stress, aggressive responses were inappropriate, disproportionate, and displaced, and there was difficulty with sharing, role taking, and perspective taking. And these problems, when they did a follow-up four to five years later, persisted. Not good. How about biological impact, both pre- and perinatal? Study done at the UCLA Fetal Alcohol and Related Disorders Clinic, uh, where they received referrals due to heavy in utero alcohol exposure. They followed 23 children ages 5 to 13, all with an IQ greater than 70. They found fetal alcohol syndrome in 9%, partial FAS in 17%, NEFAS 26%. 87% uh, of these children had some kind of an Axis I condition. 61% had a mood disorder. About a quarter of those were somewhere in the depressive spectrum. About a third were in the bipolar spectrum. So not good, it seems, to have that kind of fetal exposure. But family climate, what do we know there? A study done looking at uh, family environment in families with compared to families without parental bipolar disorder. They compared 24 families with and 27 families with healthy parents. And they used the family environment scale, which is commonly used. I'm not sure that it's the most perfect instrument uh, to really get at critical features in bipolar disorder, but it's a commonly used instrument. What they found, lower scores on cohesion and expressiveness, controlling for SES. The kind of oddball finding, when two parents had bipolar disorder, they had more cohesion than one parent with bipolar disorder. Uh, the diagnostic status of the children did not impact FES scores. Another study looking at family environment when the parents have bipolar disorder, 56 children ages 6 to 18 from 36 families, again, used the FES, and compared to norms, didn't have a control group, but just compared to the normative base for the FES, lower cohesion and organization scores, higher conflict scale. Scores did not differ whether families came in with one or two parents with a mood disorder and children with or without an Axis I or a bipolar diagnosis. How about stressful life events and social support? Okay, 140, it's the two studies that reported on the same cohort, uh, 140 offspring of 86 parents with bipolar disorder, and at a five-year follow-up, 38 had any mood disorder, five had bipolar disorder. The onset was clearly related to cumulative, severe, stressful life events. Each event increased the risk of future onset by approximately 10%. And then when they looked backward to the previous 14 months, dependent life events predicted episodes. After controlling for baseline anxiety and depressive symptoms, dependent life events doubled the risk of onset. Okay, this was a really fascinating study, uh, not a typical kind of study, I think. Looked very carefully at 23 programs from 16 studies, from 16 families, excuse me, uh, in which one parent had bipolar disorder compared to 33 control subjects. Uh, more than one or more lifetime psychiatric disorders in 70% of the probands and 45% of the controls. But what Pellegrini and colleagues looked at were the personal resources and perceived social support. The personal resources examined were intellectual ability, social problem solving skills, locus of control, self-esteem, and self-perceived competence. The perceived social support was their social network structure and the support they were perceiving. What they found was that lower perceived social support was associated with lifetime psychiatric disorders in both groups. If you didn't have a best friend, that was a unique risk factor for mood disorder. If you had support of family members, you had better overall well-being in both of the groups. And if you were relying on non-kin adults, it was associated with psychopathology in both groups, particularly the probands. And at first, that might seem a little counterintuitive, but when do we rely on non-kin adults? It's when our kin adults in our world aren't quite doing the job. Okay. But then what he found, which I, I think this is a, a fascinating uh, result, is that personal resources significantly were more 
were significantly more frequent for non-disordered probands compared to all the other groups. So if you were a control group, a control kid, you were all kind of all about the same here. So you see this line. But if you were non-disordered and you had support, you were doing significantly better. So the, those, that notion of personal resources, kind of getting at what that notion of resilience is. You might have a lot of strikes against you, but what, what are those protective factors that can really help you do okay? Psychosocial variables in children and teens of extended families identified through bipolar affective disorder probands. So in this case, they took 50 offspring, 6 to 17 years, where either an aunt, an uncle, or a grandparent had, a mood, had bipolar disorder. Uh, and you see the breakdown of those kids with mood disorder when their parents also had a mood disorder, kids with mood disorder where their parent didn't, kids without mood disorder, parents with, kids without, parents without. And what they found was that the kids who had the mood disorder uh, were reporting, the kids reported more supportive classmates, teachers, and parents. And again, maybe because their world was kind of requiring more support. That was an interesting finding. But the parents were reporting more discipline, uh, more negative life events, and more dependent negative life events. So you're getting that negative life event link once again from another data source. What do we know about youth with bipolar disorder? Again, we'll go over those five categories. Uh, this is a group out of the University of Illinois, Chicago. Uh, they compared the parent-child relationship questionnaire for 30 youth with bipolar disorder compared to 30 healthy controls matched for age, sex, SES, race, and family structure. The bipolar group reported less warmth, affection, and intimacy, more quarreling, and forceful punishment. Problems were more pronounced in families with bipolar disorder when they had elevated symptoms of mania, comorbid ADHD, earlier illness onset, single parent home, parental mood disorder, and after controlling for maternal mood, the mother's perception of their relationship with their children was more problematic if the father also had a mood disorder. Just makes life in the home pretty chaotic. This was a cross-sectional study. You really can't comment on directionality, but clearly you saw kind of problems aggregating together. The study by Geller et al., where she followed a group of kids with early onset pediatric bipolar disorder compared to kids with ADHD and healthy controls. And what she found in the BP group compared to the other two groups, uh, less warmth, greater tension and hostility. And interestingly, she had a very nice naturalistic follow-up of these three groups. And at two and four years follow-up, lower maternal warmth predicted faster relapse after recovery from mania, and intact families were associated with faster rates of recovery. So you're clearly seeing, again, those psychosocial influences on the course of disorder, not the etiology, but the course. And interestingly, medication status was not at all predictive of illness course. How about biological impact pre and perinatal? What do we know? Going back to the UIC group, uh, Pavaluri and colleagues looked at 98 children ages 5 to 18, uh, about a third with BP1 without ADHD, about a third who had BP1 plus ADHD, and then about a third, a little under a third, uh, with he healthy controls. And they tested controlling for age and sex. Is bipolar disorder predicted by a first degree relative with bipolar disorder, head injury, serious physical illness, perinatal risk, and developmental delay. So you know, they're laying out the equation. What they found was that family history was 15 times higher in the bipolar group, but each perinatal risk factor increased risk sixfold. So all of those insults, as we do our really careful intakes, and we really are looking at the prenatal history, the labor delivery, those early childhood markers, all of that really matters. And looking at those family interaction patterns, we're starting to get a sense of you need to do a really careful, comprehensive evaluation to get a sense of from whence it cometh. OK, family climate. What do we know here? Going again back to the work of Dr. Miklowitz, who after he worked with adults, realized what those of us in this room know, it's working with kids and teenagers is more fun. So now he works with adolescents with bipolar disorder. And in this sample, he had 44 adolescents and found that parents were more critical of girls than boys, particularly when there was adolescent versus child onset. And in talking with him, our best summary of kind of probably why this is happening is when a teenage girl has bipolar disorder, one of the most egregious ways she can really have manic or hypomanic symptoms is becoming very sexually active with multiple partners over a brief period of time, which rarely goes over well with mom and dad. 
A boy could probably do it and wouldn't raise quite as many hackles, particularly on the back of the dad's neck. Um, and we had the least criticism for boys. Younger kids, more criticism because the boys tend to be much more kind of explosive and you don't see as much of that in the younger girls. In our 8 to 12s, we see, if anything, more dramatic kind of behavior from boys. But by adolescence, you see a lot more of that provocative behavior from girls. Okay, uh, but just one study definitely needs replication. What do we know about expressed emotion and course of illness in adolescents with bipolar disorder? Uh, Dr. Miklowitz has developed family-focused treatment, initially for adults, now with adolescents. And in his study of 20 adolescents in an open-label trial, they used the Camberwell family interview, which is really the gold standard for measuring expressed emotion. About three-quarters of their sample was classified as high EE, a quarter low EE. They found that the adolescents in the high EE families had higher mood symptoms throughout the 24 months that they followed these kids in the study. They also had higher problem behaviors in the first year of treatment, and that gap started to narrow uh, by the second year when they were getting treatment. And here you see that in, the, in a nice graph. So you see the higher, um, the high EE in, in, in yellow and the low EE in the blue. Family conflict moderates medication response in youth with bipolar disorder. This is a group out of Case Western uh, Reserve University. 55 youth aged 5 to 17 who were prescribed either lithium or Divel Proax for eight weeks. This was a medication study, but they threw in some nice little family measures. And they found on the family assessment device, looking at the general functioning scale, the problem solving scale, and the communication scale, tested what variables would predict end of week eight scores. So you've got your baseline score, your end of week eight score at the end of the clinical trial. On the mania rating scale, only the baseline MRS score was a significant predictor. So, you know, the best predictor of current behavior is past behavior, in this case, manic symptoms. On the depression, the CDRSR, after controlling for baseline CDRSR, the FAD problem-solving scale accounted for 10% of the variance. For each one point up on the FAD problem-solving scale led to five points increase on the CDRSR. And the power to detect the impact was 0.63. Okay, so family climate, you've got to pay attention to that. Stressful life events, again, they looked, this is going back to the Geller cohort, looked at total dependent, independent, and uncertain, meaning you couldn't quite tell, oh, was this related to the mood or not, uh, life events in that same PBD, ADHD, and controls. And the kids with that early onset bi uh, bipolar disorder clearly had, of, of each of these types of life events, had more than the ADHD who had more than the normal controls and social support. Um, again, going back to the Miklowitz study, 38 adolescents with bipolar disorder. They gave a very intensive UCLA life stress interview every three months, 45 minutes just to do the life stress portion. They looked at episodic and chronic stress. Chronic stress, romantic relationships, close friendships, social activities and family relationships, etc. And they rated it on a one to five scale. The episodic, again, something that comes and goes, as you might imagine, they looked at both impact and the dependence, how independent or dependent it was. So they were looking at subjective reactions and objective evaluations of stress. And what did they find? Increased chronic stress was associated uh, in family and romantic relationships was linked with increased sustained depressive symptoms. So if you kind of are always having turmoil in your life, you tend to stay more depressed. In peer relationships, this was linked with more in sustained manic symptoms. And dependent events were more closely related to symptoms in younger versus older youth. And here you see that in a nice, pretty graph. Okay. So that was a big whirlwind tour, and I know I went through that all pretty fast, but hopefully you were just storing away little nuggets of, wow, that matter, that matter. I kept hearing about those stressful life events. Hmm, how, what would I do about that in therapy? So if you think about kind of where does that leave us, genetics are really the number one issue when it comes to etiology. There's something very physiologic, biologic at the base of bipolar disorder. Uh, one of the most heritable illnesses we have. But environmental you know, effects are not to be sneezed at. A clear, a clear number two, uh, and really seem to affect onset and course. They appear to be bidirectional. Problems beget problems. And there are critical periods of vulnerability. Never do anything bad to a child's brain the younger they are. It's a good rule of thumb. And there's broad support for the impact of family environment, parenting, stressful life events, in particular abuse, social support, and biological parameters. And when you put all of that together, where does it lead you? It really suggests a need for comprehensive biopsychosocial treatment. Okay. 
So that's where we're at with that great big review. We had a, a research uh, group meeting uh, at the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. And everybody kind of, it was a big kind of thought meeting. And then we put that to all together into a paper that got published a few years later. And in my section, which was that psychosocial section, the summary points that we came to, that we need to increase awareness of the public, mental health providers, and funding agencies, that despite the high heritability of bipolar disorder, psychosocial variables also affect illness onset and course, that studies of bipolar disorder should collect high quality psychosocial data, we need multiple types of measures to assess a wide variety of psychosocial variables, including perinatal factors. But kind of that notion of it's really not enough to give the medicine. That alone will not treat the individual with bipolar disorder. So that brings us to the summary of evidence-based psychotherapy. So what are the empirically supported psychosocial adjunctive treatments? And adjunctive because you probably would not want to treat bipolar disorder just with psychotherapy uh, for childhood bipolar disorder. We wrote our first review in 1999, and it was really easy to review the literature because there wasn't any. Okay. But what's happened since then? So we've really come a long way. So in 12 years, what have we accomplished? Really quite a bit. Um, CBT and family systems-based interventions have been the most tested. I'm going to talk with you some about the work of Pavaluri and West in the Rainbow Program. Uh, Dr. Miklowitz has the family therapy program to which I referred earlier. And then we have PEP, psychoeducational psychotherapy, both in a multifamily and an individual family format. Those of you who will be attending the workshop are going to hear all about MF PEP and IF PEP. Dialectical behavioral therapy, uh, Tina Goldstein and colleagues at Western Psychiatric Institute and Clinic. And then interpersonal social rhythm, rhythm therapy by Stephanie Halastala uh, at the University of Washington. But starting first with the Rainbow Program, in their first published paper, uh, they looked at 34 children ages 5 to 18 in a non-randomized trial. Kids either got a medication algorithm in a specialty mood clinic, plus this kind of state-of-the-art rainbow psychosocial program, or they got treatment as usual wasn't random assignment. So we can all, before the study happens, kind of guess who's probably going to do better. But lo and behold, they definitely did do better. Uh, and so you see the yellow bars, the, the kind of gray bars are the pre, and then you see the post on measures uh, of mania, depression, psychosis, aggression, ADHD, and sleep. Um, and those were all clinically and statistically significant. Translation to practice, and these slides come from Dr. West at UIC. Psychosocial treatment may help to alleviate symptoms and improve functioning. It is likely an important ingredient of a treatment model. No question about that. So it's great if you can get somebody better, but can you keep them pretty well? So then they took those 34 kids and followed them over one and two and three year follow-ups. And in reference to their post-treatment scores, uh, you see that there's a very limited variability. They were really staying pretty stable over those three-year follow-up. And the translation to clinical practice that Dr. West uh, discusses, maintenance therapy may help patients remain engaged in treatment and sustain initial treatment effects. They then took their individual family model and moved it into group treatment and had an open label trial where again they had pre-post ratings and again you see that the mania rating scale, self-report depression, uh, the parent strength and difficulty questionnaire, parenting stress scale, and therapy outcomes parent scale all improved, almost all improved from pre to post. So their, their translation to clinical practice, uh, group psychotherapy may help alleviate symptoms, improve children's psychosocial functioning, and increase parents' knowledge and efficacy around the disorder. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of a sense, and, and the Rainbow Program very nicely goes through uh, a very similar to content, just slightly different packaging than what you're going to hear when I go through PEP in a bit more detail. And I would say the same really is true for the work of Dr. Miklowitz, who again started with adults. In a study that they did in Colorado, they followed 101 adults and found that when you combined, and in this case they had uh, individual therapy or they had the FFT, plus medication done in a very nice algorithm format in their clinic, they found that adding on the family component delayed relapse by half of a year, which is a substantial important clinical outcome. And also reduced mood symptoms, the gains began by six months into treatment and continued throughout the 24 months of the follow-up in this study. In an earlier study uh, done at UCLA, um, 
they, found, they looked at 53 adults, and again, they had they, all the adults were getting medication management via an algorithm done in a nicely organized and maintained follow-up clinic. And then they, in the blue line, got individually focused treatment. The yellow line, they got family focused treatment. And you see this is the survival uh, analysis, so when they go back and, and are rehospitalized. And clearly an advantage. So even when you have psychosocial treatment added on to medication, having that family, uh, you know, other than just the individual with the illness, but bringing in that containing environment makes a significant impact. Then Dr. Miklowitz decided, as I said earlier, that adolescents are more fun, and they started with an N of 20 open trial and found that mood and behavior following treatment improved. They did ratings every three months for 12 months and found that the KSADS depression score came down, the KSADS mania score came down, and the child behavior checklist behavior problem T score came down uh, by four standard deviations. And they're currently do, uh, completing a uh, randomized clinical trial. So those, uh, stud those interventions have many, many commonalities. Uh, the one study that I'll review or the one uh, research group that I'll review that's a little bit different is dialectical behavioral therapy. Uh, and rather, I won't go into the details of DBT. You probably know a bit about it. Uh, but this is a little bit twist on the CBT kind of perspective. And Tina Goldstein uh, at the University of Pittsburgh is uh, studying this. And she has two open label trials. And I'll share with you just some quick results from her first N of 10 open label trial, had 14 to 18 year olds, um, predominantly female, and you see the BP1, 2, and NOS split. These are kids who had hospitalization, suicide attempts, and average age of illness onset was 13. You see that over time that their, uh, their mean scores on emotion dysregulation were improving, as were their suicidality ratings. And other domains of improvement that were measured over the first year of open label treatment were the number of hospitalizations, depressive symptoms, non-suicidal self-injurious behavior. Uh, all of those improved over the course of the year. And over 90% of scheduled sessions were attended, which speaks to the palatability, if you will, of the intervention. Uh, and they had high treatment satisfaction ratings. She then followed up, and this is all uh, funded through a K, and I believe now an R34 award. Uh, in her second N of 10 open label trial, they, by this time they had tinkered with their treatment enough that they had a manualized treatment. They added the DBT consultation team onto it. They also looked at access to psychopathology, and they had behavioral and psychophysiologic assessment of emotional dysregulation. And some of her early findings, these are not yet published, but she shared her slides with me to be able to share with this group today. Uh, again, average age range of 16, 13 to 18 year olds. So again, you're going a little bit to the older adolescent. And I think in DBT, some of the concepts are a little tricky to use with younger kids. So it makes sense that she's focused on that somewhat older adolescent group. Uh, and again, a combination of BP1, 2, and NOS. These kids have been hospitalized and made suicide attempts, and their age of illness onset was around, on average, 12. You see the percentage of sessions attended was pretty good, around 75%. And again, uh, over the one year uh, open label follow up, suicidal ideation decreases, suicidality on a broader measure decreases, depression scores go down, emotion dysregulation scores go down, and the percent of time spent well increases over one year. So some very promising early results from, uh, from Goldstein and colleagues, and I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing more from her on that. Also initially developed at Pittsburgh is interpersonal is social rhythm therapy, and, and Dr. Ellen Frank really originated that for adults. And Stephanie Halastala uh, worked with her and developed an adolescent modification of that and has published an N of 12 open label trial of adolescents with bipolar spectrum disorder. And they attended 16 to 18 adjunctive treatment sessions over the course of 20 weeks. 11 out of 12 completed treatment, and they had 97% uh, treatment attendance, which is quite good. And she reported a significant decrease in manic 
depressive and general psychiatric symptoms and an increase in global functioning over time with effect sizes that were reported to be medium large to large. So again, promising. And this is this goes back, this is maybe a little bit closer to the CBT that you heard with the Pavaluri's group uh, and Pavaluri and West and also the Miklowitz group, a little bit more CBT-esque, if you will. And then that brings us to the work that we've done at OSU with the psychoeducation program. The orientation that we have taken is very much a non-blaming, growth-oriented kind of a model using a biopsychosocial framework. And the therapeutic underpinnings are really taken from family systems and cognitive behavioral techniques. It was our belief that providing families with education and support and skill building would lead to better understanding of the disorder. If you have a better understanding of the disorder, it'll lead to better treatment of the disorder, as well as less conflict within the family as appropriate attributions are being made. And if you have a better family environment and better treatment, that should all lead to better outcome. We've developed three formats, the multifamily psychoeducational psychotherapy, or what we call MFPEP, the individual family psychoeducational psychotherapy, or IFPEP, and then we've also delivered this in workshops for our uh, parents of kids who come to our inpatient unit. Our first study, uh, funded by the Ohio Department of Mental Health, published now almost 10 years ago, we had 35 children and their parents, uh, about 50-50 split between kids with depressive spectrum and bipolar spectrum. These kids had on average three and a half comorbid diagnoses that ranged from one to seven. That's very commonplace for kids who have uh, a mood disorder. Their C gasset baseline on average was 51. Uh, most of them came to us already on medication. They were 8 to 11 because they had to be to enter the study. The average age was 10 and as you might expect knowing that age group, uh, three quarters of them were boys. We had a six month wait list design because this study was done on a complete shoestring. And those of you who are students in the room designing your own studies, uh, here's why you would never design a six month wait list. Who's happier, a child in January or a child in July? Okay, okay, don't do it, bad idea. Uh, but it was a very inexpensive study. Um, so we had six sessions, 75 minutes a session, manual driven treatment. I ran most of the parent groups on this uh, early study. And at the end, at the end of every sixth session, I would think, wow, we're just getting to the good stuff. If I could just keep working with these families a little bit longer. We ran a focus group and brought in community partners as well as participants uh, from the group at the end to s give us feedback and say, you know, we're, we're tinkering with this, we're designing this, help us do a better job. And they said, if we could just have more time with you. I thought, oh, at least we agree on that. That's good. <laughs> we all wanted to be together longer. Uh, so we made it longer. But what did we find first from this study? Uh, in this small study, uh, RCT, we found that we were able to increase knowledge of mood disorders in the parents, and that's good because if it's a psychoeducational uh, intervention and you haven't taught people anything, you probably haven't accomplished anything at all. But education without change in behavior is not very useful either. So that's good, but it's not enough. Fortunately, we had more. Uh, parents reported increased positive family interactions, increased efficacy in seeking treatment. And this is something that makes, I think, this kind of a psychoeducational approach a little bit different from some other interventions because part of what we're wanting to do, we really conceptualize, if you have bipolar disorder as a young child, you probably have a lifelong illness. And you need to think about how do you manage a chronic illness in a way that doesn't monopolize your life. Okay, so we want people learning how to be better seekers of appropriate health care and to not seek care that isn't beneficial. So we want them all to understand efficacious interventions. They reported improved coping skills, improved social support, and an improved attitude toward the child in treatment. The kids reported that when we treated them, their parents got better. Don't you love it when that happens in a child intervention? Okay. And they reported a trend toward increased social support from peers. So as I alluded to, those six sessions, 75 minutes, that was nice, but it wasn't enough. So we expanded it to eight sessions, 90 minutes each, and we were funded then by NIMH to do a larger clinical trial, randomized controlled trial, again, for kids between the ages of eight and 11 with any major mood disorder. Uh, and in these sessions, we begin and end with parents and children together. The bulk of each session is done separately for parents and children, and kids receive in vivo social skills training. We had the luxury of having a gym, but you need a room that kids can get up and move around. These groups are run like 5 to 6.30 on a weeknight. Most of our kids have comorbid ADHD. Most of them have stimulants that are wearing off. And our therapists always wear tennis shoes. Okay. 
It's a very active group. Uh, therapists, you need one therapist for the parent group, two for the kids group. You need a lead therapist who can really run the content of the group, and you need a second therapist in the room to help with behavior management. Uh, families receive projects to do between the sessions that carry on the lesson of the day. What do we do? In a nutshell, and those of you attending the workshop will hear much more detail about this, but in the first session for the parents, uh, there's a welcome. Uh, we you know, have everybody together, and then when we have just the parents, we really review with them what the symptoms of mood disorders are, what we know about course of disorder, and kind of how we conceptualize diagnosis. Second session, we talk about medications, not in a prescriptive fashion, not in a, gee, from what you've told me about your child, I think he should be on this dose of this medicine. That's not appropriate for our level of intervention. What we talk about are some of the metacognitive principles about medication. What are the, the classes of medication? What are the target symptoms for which they were designed and tested and have some proven efficacy? Uh, you're probably going to have side effects. How can you manage them? How do you effectively communicate with your prescriber uh, so that you really can be an active partner in the treatment? In the third session, we talk about systems of care, both the school and the mental health system. If I got a nickel for every time I was asked, well, why do I need a psychiatrist and a therapist? We could probably all retire early, okay? It's a common question. It makes sense to us because we're in this business. Families aren't in this business. They're trying to raise their kids, okay? So it doesn't make particular sense. And there's an alphabet soup when it comes to schools, IEPs and 504s and MFEs and all these things. And what does it mean? And how do I get help for my child? So we want to help explain the mystery of all of that to parents so they learn how to better advocate, they learn what they can ask for, and they learn how to do it in a diplomatic fashion. Fourth session, we talk about the negative family cycle. I loved it when I would run this session because if you had couples there, you would see the elbows go, like, what does she do, look in our window at night? Well, actually, I don't. Um, but there's some very predictable patterns that can happen in families when they're experiencing the stress of a highly provoking child who has very scary symptoms. If you are manic and you've stripped naked and you're running through the house screaming, that's very alarming. If you're so depressed that you run out into the street trying to be run over by a car, that's very distressing. Okay, And what parents have reported to us that they have heard back from their therapists uh, when those behaviors have occurred uh, would make your skin crawl because we've heard some very untherapeutic responses or at least as the families relate them back to us. So it's not at all surprising that families get very, very stressed and fall into some pretty negative ruts. And so then it's our job to get them out of those ruts. And how do you do that? We go back to those fundamentals of therapy, problem solving and communication skills, but we use those in the service of symptom management. Session seven is really all about the unique features of parenting a child who has a severe mood disorder. And then the last session is a kind of a general wrap up, final Q&A, and then we have a nice little graduation ceremony. What do we do with the kids? Something fairly similar. First session, we talk with them about their symptoms and their disorders once we've got them alone in their room. So if I say, if we go up to one of the kids and he says, hi, I'm Brandon, I'm bipolar. Well, Brandon, so nice to meet you. What does it mean that you have bipolar disorder? I don't know. Okay. That's not insight. That's I can pair it back what somebody told to me. But that's not useful. That's not powerful. That doesn't help that child manage his symptoms. So kids need to understand what the symptoms are, how they affect them, and what they can do about that. It's very straight up. Second session, we talk to them about medications. Again, fairly similarly, but developmentally appropriate for the kids group, so that they understand why they're swallowing these pills every day. I personally wouldn't take a pill if I didn't know why I was taking it, so I don't know how we could expect kids day after day after day to keep swallowing pills for reasons that they don't understand. So we want them to understand the reasons for the medicine. We also want them to become observant reporters. So if they're experiencing a lot of side effects without a lot of relief, they probably shouldn't be taking that medicine. But how do you effectively, you know, just cheeking the medicine and spitting it out later, but not talking to anybody about why I don't think this is working, isn't so effectual because you might just get more of the medicine next time you go back to the doctor, as opposed to, I don't like this medicine and let me tell you why. Okay, so we help kids learn how to be appropriately assertive in communicating uh, their, in their input about medications. The third session, we have them build a toolkit to manage emotions. And this is, again, kind of pretty standard stuff, but we, they build a, a kind of a repertoire of, of behaviors that they can use for soothing themselves, getting themselves calmed down. Fourth session, connection between thoughts, feelings, and actions. This is really the fundamentals of cognitive behavioral therapy. We use a lot of the language of responsibility and choices. Session five, we move to problem solving. The kids get two sessions on communication. There's been some really fascinating work done uh, 
first did the intramural branch of NIMH, but now by several research groups, showing that kids with bipolar disorder have particular difficulty reading facial affect in others, and they will overread and, and, and get miscues about what they see in the environment. So if I think that all four of you are really angry at me, I might create a world in which now you have reasons to be angry at me. I might kick your lunchbox over and I might knock into you purposefully and I might say something really rude to you on the playground and I might just totally ignore you when you try to talk to me. Well now all four of you really are annoyed with me, but you weren't before, but I've now created that world because I have misread the cues. So we work very specifically on reading those nonverbal kind of cues. Then verbal communication. The final session we do a review Jeopardy-like game and it's always fun when you think the kid who didn't get anything out of group, but you hope their parent did because you thought the kid was tuned out the whole time. And then they answer all the questions. It makes you feel really good like you did teach them something. Okay. Lots and lots and lots of contributors to our research. And here's the randomized control trial that we ran thanks to NIMH. Uh, we brought in 225 families. 90% of them passed our screen. Most of those people arrived at the baseline, and of those, most met study criteria. Referral sources were from healthcare providers, both primary care physicians and mental health providers in the community. About one out of five came from media. These were not paid advertisements. These were stories in our newspaper, our radio, and TV coverage. But one out of five came through just random sources, word of mouth, posters at the library, that sort of thing. We had a very wide distribution uh, of of referrals, so we got families from throughout the state of Ohio, one family from Erie, PA, who faithfully came to every winter group that we had through the ice belt. Uh, we had a very wide array of family structure, uh, so you've got the uh, TAAU as treatment as usual, so the MFPEP plus treatment as usual or the wait list. Uh, we had married biological parents, step families, married adoptive parents, single parents, single adoptive parents. We had grandparents raising kids. We had lesbian couples. We had every possible imaginable family structure in our study. Wide range of income. Uh, the majority of families were in that 40 to 60,000 range. Uh, we did some analyses looking at the role of SES and it impacted nothing on outcome. In terms of comorbidities, about 70, you, here you see the total sample, 70%, and this was not what we expected when we started the study, 70% of our sample were in the bipolar spectrum. How in the world did that happen? Uh, because the fall before we got our grant, uh, Dr. Uh, Papalos, who wrote that first book, The Bipolar Child, came to our local community and gave a presentation, and I was the local person also on the speaker's docket. And my last slide was, I think we're getting a study, and I think we might be able to provide a treatment study for your child if you think your child has a mood disorder, so call this number, but don't put all your eggs in this basket. The first 50 families in our study came from that conference. It was just amazing. So we ended up with many more kids with bipolar disorder than we had initially expected. We were taking depression and bipolar. So in our bipolar only sample, 70% had comorbid anxiety disorder, 95% had comorbid uh, behavior disorder, 80% of them had ADHD. So you see lots and lots of stimulant in these kids. Two thirds of them came from two parent families, which included step parents. That's very important because the one third who came from single parent families, I think those families have extra challenges. When the parent really needs a break, it's a little harder to take it. And so we have to help them problem solve how they can get away when they need to get away. And you see an average round trip uh, of significant mileage. These were on average about 10 year old uh, kids. The majority were male, the majority were white. Uh, over half had a family history of mania. Uh, almost three quarters had a family history of depression. And when we said you have depression or mania, we were in that 83, 84% range. The study design brought everybody in at baseline. After we did the assessment, we randomized. Half went in, a little over half went into wait list, half went into immediate treatment. Everybody in the meantime was getting treatment as usual. And what makes our study different from the studies that you heard from Miklowitz and Pavaluri is that in those settings, they were also getting medication management in their clinic. In ours, because we were getting kids from throughout the state, please have at it. Get, get whatever other treatment you're getting, and then we're going to just do this add-on eight-session group and measure the impact. We also were very interested in whether or not we would change their treatment utilization of other resources, and would we help them become better consumers over time. So that was a kind of a unique hypothesis to our design. Intervention happened between baseline and six months, brought everybody back at six months, measured them, measured them again at 12 months, at which time the waitlist group went into the group and we brought everybody back at 18 months. 
our primary outcome measure was the mood severity index, which combined mathematically a depression rating scale and a mania rating scale, because we wanted to, it doesn't do much, if you bring depression down but mania goes up, you really haven't done the kid a favor. We wanted to see that the overall mood score declined. So what did we find? And this is in the intent to treat sample. Uh, so you see this line that the colors are a little hard. So here's our baseline. It's six months, so treatment occurred here. Probably the most exciting part of our findings were that for the next 12 months, when all we, we assessed at 12 months, we assessed at 18 months. In a psychotherapy trial, if it's beneficial, symptoms tend to go down. When you stop therapy, you typically get a little moving back up. Maybe not a lot, but just a little smidge back up. But in our case, we kept having declining mood severity scores for the next 12 months. Now, I don't think it's all because they said, what did we do in session three? Oh, let's pull out session three right now, you know, eight months later. I think it's because we did help propel them into better treatment. We did give them kind of the building blocks of good therapy. Some of it was thinking back to what they learned. Some of it was how they were continuing to use those skills in their everyday life. The wait list group looks like they were also benefiting from being on the wait list. And we were giving lots of referrals at the baseline. You know, my ethical need to families struggling, we were making lots and lots of referrals to our waitlist families. Um, so they were starting to look like they were getting better, but they couldn't hold it. So by six, by six months later, they were up here, and then they got treatment from here to here. And the slope here, so the rate of improvement was the same for the waitlist group as it was for the immediate treatment group, but their endpoint was statistically and clinically significantly different because obviously the immediate families had a year head start. Now this is the treated sample. First I showed you the intent to treat. That's the most conservative. Here's your most liberal analysis where you take just those who completed treatment and look at their outcome and you see a stronger crossover if you can see the lines there. Amy Mendenhall, who now is on faculty at the University of Kansas in social work, uh, looked on her, for, in her dissertation data on the impact of MFPEP on service utilization and mood severity and found that parental attitudes toward treatment changes with MFPEP and it impacts the quality of services sought. So we wanted to make parents better consumers and lo and behold, we did. It improved the quality of, improved quality of services, leads to better mental health outcomes, and so we have accomplished what we had hoped we would when we set out. MFPEP appears to improve quality of services utilized and children's mood severity over time as designed. It helps parents become better consumers. I love anecdotes, even though they aren't science, but I think it gives a little qualitative feel to what the experience is like. So a couple of quotes from parents. Uh, no matter how bad the situation is, there is hope and treatment. Don't give up. This program was an eye-opener for me. I also was encouraged and relieved to find out that I was not alone. And here you see a couple of key components. When people get into treatment that is not efficacious, not only do they burn up time and money, which at least you can, you know, the next day you're going to have more time, and then the next paycheck, you're going to have more money. But when you use up hope, you've used up hope. And I really worry about that with families who are seeking ineffectual treatment, that we're burning up, we, the larger treatment community, are burning up hope. And then they'll say to us when they get to us, oh, but nothing works. And it might be that nothing has worked in the past, but we're hoping that what we've got will help and will work. Listen to what they're saying. They can really help you. Learn what is going on with your child. There's that educational piece. Stay focused what is, on what is going on with your child and do not give up on your child. I love that. What did the kids have to say? You get to meet new people you never knew before. They help you with your symptoms. They're nice and they're helpful and you guys support us and give us snacks. <laughs> we gave them water bottles and goldfish crackers. Okay, uh, it wasn't too extravagant. You've been nice to us, and this is my favorite, and treated us with respect. These kids are frequently the pariah of their local elementary school. And here they come together, and I always would tell the groups, we would always do a review of the, the kids' diagnoses and profiles before we would start the group. And after I heard the profiles, the clinical profiles of all the kids who were going to start group like the next day, I always had the fantasy that if I was the child therapist, maybe I would just run away from home and not do the group. It sounded kind of intimidating to me, because we had pretty impaired kids. But they would get together and they would be incredibly supportive of each other. And we were, they were in a place where we really got what their problems were. And that, for many of them, was a very unique experience. It really helps out if you let it.
Okay, so that's a little bit about the group, uh, and that's nice, but not everybody can do group, and sometimes it's hard in the various practice settings to run a group. So then we were interested in could we turn this into an individual family model and get any bang for our buck. <clears throat> so we got another grant from our Ohio Department of Mental Health, enrolled 20 kids now all with bipolar spectrum disorder, and took those eight sessions and just divvied them out. So parent-child, parent-child went to 16 sessions. We had pretty much the same content of the MF PEP, but also added in healthy habits where we look at diet, sleep, and exercise with a comparable design. And what you see here is even when you have a small sample size, you can randomize, but our baseline, they were not similar on severity. So our immediate treatment group were more severely impaired, and you see a nice decline over time, baseline six and 12 months. And there's our weightless group. So we had reasonable effect sizes. Anonymous evaluations completed after treatment. Uh, on a one to five scale, parents reported learning about symptoms, medication, and accessing treatment. They reported having more skills in terms of working with schools and the treatment team and managing symptoms at home and feeling supported and not blamed. What did the kids have to say? Overall, we got pretty positive ratings. They reported more knowledge about mood symptoms and medication, reported a better ability to get along with families, friends, and school. They reported more skills in terms of symptom management. They felt supported and less isolated, like I'm not the only one. And interestingly, this is in our individual format of intervention. But if somehow knowing that we had this treatment program for kids just like them still felt very reassuring to them. And once again, when we treated the kids, the parents' behavior shaped up. Okay. So that was nice, but we were again feeling a little antsy at the end of these 16 sessions. And when we really thought about face-to-face -face time, it wasn't as much as the families were getting in the group format. So once again, we kind of expanded. So we did a two case study series. This was supposed to be larger than two case studies, but I had a postdoc who was going to do this as an extra project. And by the time we got the IRB approval, he was coming to the end of a two-year postdoc, and we finished two kids in this case study. So it's little tiny case series. Um, and what, how did we expand these sessions? We added a sibling session, one additional systems of care session, a school professional session where we worked specifically with the folks at school, either through a conference call or an in-person visit, added an extra healthy habit session, and had more in-the-bank sessions. And very briefly, the case studies, an 11-year-old girl we'll call Jane with a very long treatment history. She'd had lots of medication trials, sertraline, had lots of bad side effects, Divalproax, clonidine, quetiapine, no significant improvement. Uh, and then she had uh, fluvoxamine and clonazepam for her compulsive behavior and agitation. She had school and private therapeutic support. She'd had so many services and had just not responded well to anything. A 10-year-old boy we'll call John, who also had a very extensive treatment history, two years on Divalproax, four years on Risperidone, six years with Atomoxetine. Some of these were stacked on top of each other. Um, eight years, uh, by eight years, he'd had multiple trials of a variety of medications you see listed there. Same at years nine and 10. He'd had very significant weight gain from some of the atypical antipsychotics, and he'd had a very extensive psychotherapy history, pretty much all for naught. He had not gotten better whatsoever. Uh, you see a long list of diagnoses. Jane had BP-1, most recent episode mixed. She had moderate to severe symptoms, and you see the long listing of them. She also had ADHD combined, um, functioned as somebody with ODD, even though it was always in the context of the mood disorder, GAD, and obsessive compulsive disorder. John also had BP-1, also had ADHD, ODD, phobia, and separation anxiety disorder. And from pre to post, looking at CGAS, current and worst, the um, Kitty SADS mania rating scale, Kitty SADS depression rating scale, and the treatment belief questionnaire, parent form, all of those improved pre to post for Jane, and most of them improved for John. When you combine his mania rating sc scale and the depression rating scale and added them together, overall he showed mood improvement, but his depression score worsened over treatment. So neither of these kids ended our study squeaky clean, but they were better than when they came in. And these are kids both with very, very severe presentations who will need lifelong intervention. Okay, so that gives a little bit of a nutshell of what we've done with the MF-PEP and the IF-PEP. So altogether, three RCTs, uh, two for the MF-PEP and one for the IF-PEP. Uh, some resources. I'm going to put a plug in for families everywhere to participate in clinical trials uh, because it's a great way to get comprehensive assessment, probably more than you'll get in almost any other setting. 
and oftentimes free treatment. And we have two studies that we're starting, that we have just started at, at OSU. Uh, we call them the OATS trials. Uh, they're parallel design, uh, omega-3 and therapy study. Uh, in each of these studies, we're enrolling 60 kids. It's a 12-week trial for 8 to 14-year-olds. In the depression study, obviously, we're enrolling kids with depression. Uh, they can't have had meds or psychotherapy in the previous month other than stable stimulants and sleep aids. Half of the kids will get omega-3, half of them will get placebo, half of them will get IFPEP, half of them will get active monitoring, and we'll follow them up over time. Second study for kids with bipolar NOS and cyclothymic disorder. We have no treatment guidelines whatsoever for those kids. All the medication trials have been for BP1 and sometimes BP2 thrown in. So same design there. So I'll put in a, just a plug in general for clinical trials for families. And then finally, in terms of resources, I have lots of books that I can recommend. And I think this can be very helpful for kids and teenagers. This is a nice book, uh, just it's a fiction book. But if kind of preteens, young, young teens uh, want to kind of be one step removed, it's a nice way of reading about bipolar disorder. Uh, books for parents that we can recommend. And I think parents becoming educated so that they become good consumers is just a really critical feature. Other books for adults of, for related problems. Educational websites, which is very, very important in getting specific ideas about how to help kids. NATSAP is a great resource for families who are saying we need to do a temporary out-of-home placement. And then there are lots of groups and websites that we can send families to to get additional information. And that is all in your handouts. Um, Phototherapy and nutritional intervention we'll talk more about in the workshop, uh, but those are some leads on getting information. Evidence-based treatments, go to www.effectivechildtherapy.com. It's a Division 53 Society of Clinical Child and Adolescent Psychology plus the Association of Behavioral and Cognitive Therapy joint um, product that we've developed, and it's highly recommended. And then for those interested, we have the treatment manual that Guilford has just published that talks about PEP and then also the workbooks that go along with that. Uh, and those are, those are at the moodychildtherapy.com. Thank you.